Microcontrollers with more than one core are becoming more popular, and we can use them to help us parallelize tasks, which is especially useful for things like machine learning or Wi-Fi stacks. Most ESP32 cores you come across will have two cores, and we can use this to test what it's like running tasks on each core. In some ways, using a multi-core processor with an RTOS is trivial, and in some ways, not so much. Let's jump in. The first thing we need to do is look at the difference between AMP and SMP. AMP stands for Asymmetric Multiprocessing, and this came before SMP, or Symmetric Multiprocessing. With AMP, you need to have two or more processors or cores that can communicate. One core is in charge of running the operating system and sends out tasks, or jobs, to the other cores. Note that the secondary cores may have their own OS in order to accept and run tasks, but AMP requires that one core is in charge of sending out the tasks. In SMP, each core or processor is treated equally and runs the same operating system. A shared list of tasks can be accessed by all cores and each core pulls from that list in order to figure out what to work on. You have the option of using the same or different architectures for the cores with AMP. You can even use different processors or separate computers if you want. You'll almost always find that SMP uses the same architecture for each of its cores, as they need to be tightly coupled to share resources. The cores or processors have a shared memory and input-output bus where they can all access common memory and peripherals. Here is a block diagram of our ESP32. It has two cores, the protocol core and the application core. The pro core is also labeled as CPU0, and the app core is also labeled as CPU1. Both cores are the same Extensa LX6 architecture and share a bus that they use to access memory and various peripherals. Even though it looks like cache is shared, it's not really. In some multi-core architectures, each core has its own cache memory. In the ESP32, the first 64 kilobytes of shared instruction RAM is set aside to be cache. The first 32 kilobytes is cache for core 0, and the second 32 kilobytes is cache for core 1. This will be important later as it affects determinism in SMP programming. The protocol core in the ESP32 is intended to run tasks for various communication protocols like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The intention is to have the user run their program in the application core separate from the networking stacks in core 0. I recommend sticking to this model if you're using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth as missing a deadline in one of those networking protocols could mean missed data. However, if we're not using such protocols, we can explore running tasks on both cores. Note that Vanilla Free RTOS does not support multi-core execution, which means everything I'm about to tell you comes from the ESP IDF port of Free RTOS. How other RTOSs implement multi-core support may be different. Each core runs an independent scheduler, each with its own tick timer. That means we can't assume tasks on core 0 will execute at the same time or in sync with tasks on core 1. The task control block, stack, and code for each task exists in shared memory, which means that either core is capable of running any given task. In ESP IDF, we have the option of letting the scheduler in either core choose the highest priority task in the ready state from a shared list or pinning a task to a core on creation. If we pin a task to a core, we're telling that task that it should always run in a particular core. For example, if I pin task A to core 0, it will never run in core 1. Let's see that in code. I've made a simple application that runs a low priority task and a high priority task. Task L runs at priority 1 and task H runs at priority 2. Every 200 milliseconds, each task prints its name and which core it's running to the serial terminal. Note that I'm using a very poorly made delay here. It's just a for loop that hogs the processor. I do this so that each task never yields. When I create the tasks, I give the desired core as the final argument. I'll put both tasks on core 0. You'll see that I've taken away our single or dual core assignment at the top of the program, which means that this will only work on a dual core ESP32 chip. Let's upload and run this program. <laughs> 
When I open the serial monitor, you can see that task H is running on core 0 and never yields to the scheduler, which means task L never gets a chance to run. You'll also see something else important happen. The processor resets after a few seconds. Core 0 has a special task watchdog timer set to trigger if the scheduler is not called every few seconds. This is to help prevent the wireless communication tasks from being stuck in a loop. Note that this watchdog timer is not set for core 1 by default. We could pin one task to core 0 and the other task to core 1. This would certainly solve our issue. The other thing we could do is use this task no affinity constant, which tells the task that it can run on either core. Each scheduler will find whichever highest priority task is in the ready state and run it. Let's upload this program and see what happens. As you can see, task L now runs periodically on one core and task H on the other. Which core runs each task might change, but since we are only running two tasks right now, each core just continues to grab the same task over and over. Some RTOS implementations may have multi-core support out of the box, but free RTOS does not. As a result, I highly recommend reading over this document that goes over the changes in ESP IDF from FreeRTOS. Each multi-core processor will be slightly different, so you'll probably want to spend some time understanding how the architecture is set up and how you can use the cores most effectively. FreeRTOS maintains a list of tasks in the ready state. This list is an array where each element corresponds to a priority level and contains a linked list of all the tasks in the ready state at that priority. In ESP IDF, this list is shared between the cores. When the scheduler in each core is called, it looks at this list to determine which task should be run. The task control block of each task contains a field that determines if it can run on core 0, core 1, or no affinity. If that field matches the calling core or is no affinity, the core knows it can run that task. A shared index variable for each priority list is updated whenever a task is chosen by a scheduler. It's possible for the schedulers to skip tasks when you mix pinned and unpinned tasks. Because of this, it becomes very hard to predict which core will run each task when. While it's still technically deterministic, it becomes nearly impossible to calculate the exact timing of events and instruction execution. When you pin a task to a core, it's capable of relying on that core's cache to make it faster to work with pieces of data that get used often. If you assign no affinity to a task and it switches which core it runs on, the working data will no longer be in cache memory. As a result, the core will need to spend more time fetching data from main memory and updating the cache. Once again, these cache misses make it much harder to predict the exact timing of events when we don't know when a task will switch cores. In some architectures, interrupts might be shared among the cores. On the ESP32, each core has its own set of 32 interrupts. In code, you can assign an external event to trigger one of these interrupts, such as a pin level change or a DMA buffer filling up. When the interrupt triggers, it halts processing in its core to run the associated interrupt service routine in that core. Once again, it becomes difficult to know exactly which task was halted if we let the schedulers arbitrarily choose which task to run in each core. As we've already seen, each core also contains a few internal peripherals that can trigger interrupts, such as watchdog timers. These core-specific internal peripherals cannot trigger interrupts in the other core. I'd like to reiterate that what I'm showing you is what you'll find on the ESP32. Other microcontrollers may or may not be different, so I strongly recommend reading the documentation for your part to learn how things are configured. All that leaves us with the question, do we pin tasks to a particular core or let the schedulers decide? There are several benefits to letting the schedulers in the cores decide which task to run next. First of all, it's generally easier to use. Just set the task to no affinity and that's it. This is also the easiest way to get close to complete optimization of CPU utilization. The amount of idle time should be minimized so long as there's a task ready. One of the cores will just take that task. Finally, we don't have to worry much about load balancing, as the CPUs will automatically handle that for us. 
On larger systems like smartphones and desktops, this is usually how you'll write multi-threaded programs. You create threads and let the operating system decide which core to use. However, this technique has some serious flaws that you should consider. By pinning a task to a core, you'll know the location of interrupts unless all interrupts are shared. On the ESP32, if you create an interrupt in core 0, that interrupt will always run in ISR in core 0, regardless of where the creating task is running when the interrupt happens. While you miss out on automatic load balancing, you'll gain more control of the cores. You could potentially achieve optimal throughput by pinning tasks to cores, as you'll have fewer cache misses. However, you'll have to spend a lot of time and energy figuring out optimal placement and scheduling of tasks. Finally, execution is more deterministic when you know exactly which core is running which task. While we won't get into it in this series, being able to exactly determine when something will execute is important in some RTOS applications, like medical equipment and space missions. For microcontrollers, you'll usually want the extra control and determinism, so it makes sense to pin tasks to cores. In fact, the ESP32 already does this when it pins Wi-Fi and Bluetooth tasks to core 0. As long as we have shared memory, like we do with the ESP32, kernel objects should work the same. That means we should not need to do anything special to use queues, mutexes, and semaphores. Here's another quick demo that I made. Task 0 runs in core 0 and task 1 runs in core 1. Task 0 gives a shared semaphore every 500 milliseconds. Whenever task 1 gets that semaphore, it toggles the LED. In setup, you can see that I create the binary semaphore just like we did in a previous episode. Let's run this. And I just made an overly complicated blinky. Core 0 sends a message to core 1 to toggle an LED. Something that gets weird is critical sections. In vanilla free RTOS, you can use task enter and exit critical to mark critical sections of code. They're much more severe than a mutex, as they prevent the scheduler from running and disable interrupts up to a certain priority level while execution is inside that critical section. ESP IDF introduces another layer of complexity thanks to the need to work with two cores. When entering a critical section, you need to provide a spin lock. This is similar to a mutex, as it's a global variable that works as a lock. Unlike a mutex, it forces any core that attempts to grab it when it's already taken to wait in a while loop, which is known as spinning. I'll have pin 13 turn on for 200 milliseconds while in this critical section. Remember that the scheduler will not run while in this critical section of code. The long delay is a terrible idea, but it's useful to show what's happening. Then I'll yield the processor for 100 milliseconds. All of this is running in core 1. In core 0, we'll just toggle pin 12 every 30 milliseconds. Let's upload this. I'll connect my oscilloscope probes to pins 12 and 13 so we can see what's going on. Pin 12 is still toggling every 30 milliseconds in the first task even though we tell the scheduler to stop running for 200 milliseconds in the other task. That's because the tasks are running on different cores. Now let's use the same spin lock in task 0. As I mentioned, if task 0 gets to this point when task 1 is inside the critical section, core 0 will simply spin doing nothing waiting for the lock to be returned. You would expect pin 12 here to stay at its current level while core 1 was in the critical section and then toggle a few times while the other core idled, but things get weird. This is not at all what we might expect to see. The timing of core 1 gets messed up pretty badly. It no longer waits for 100 milliseconds and that prevents core 0 from toggling the pin a few times in that idle period. As it turns out, some really funky things happen inside the ESP32. Because we stop the scheduler with these critical section markers, the underlying ESP IDF will try to figure out how many times the tick timer should have been called. It updates the internal counter variable, which is used for things like VTask delay to figure out when a task should come out of the blocked state. This fast forwarding process can be helpful if it's accurate when you need to make up for one or two lost ticks. However, it can really mess with things when you have long critical sections. The lesson here is to avoid critical sections if you can. If you can't, then you should make them as short as possible. 
I'll change the hog delay time to one millisecond and upload the code again. This looks much better. Pin 13 stays on for one millisecond and pin 12 is allowed to toggle during the task one idle time. Now for your challenge. Remember this fun project? You are to convert it to support both cores in the ESP32. The ISR and task A, which averages batches of samples, should both run in core zero. Task B, which echoes characters to the serial terminal, should run in core one. When you enter AVG in the serial terminal, it should respond with the most recently computed average, just like it did last time. While this application is simple enough to run in one core, this should give you an idea of how to work with multiple cores in an RTOS. The program should work just like it used to. The serial characters are echoed back to me, and when I enter AVG, I get a printout of the most recent average from the ADC batch. If you use kernel objects to pass data back and forth and synchronize your tasks, you should only need to change a few lines of code to get it working with dual core support. I know there are plenty of other topics we could dive into when it comes to real-time operating systems, but I must end the series here. I want to thank you for sticking with it to the end, and I hope it has given you some good tips for working with an RTOS. Good luck, and as always, happy hacking!